only giraffes and elephants could get higher up in the, in the, during the, the dry season. Uh, this fellow here is a, a nice old, you can see a lot of the, the scars and so on, and so many of you see pictures. You want to feel in here, you can see his dew claw, and that's how he hangs on animals. And uh, I, uh, harvesting he, I got malaria, and my bride had to come and fly me back. I couldn't die. He's a swamp. Uh, lions now in Africa, like any other wild, they're in the brush all the time. So the only big main lions you usually see are in a zoo. But in the swamps, in the Mayawasi area of western Tanzania, it's in the swamps, and they hunt the swamp, so they don't pull the mane, and many times they're black, and I wanted to harvest the black mane, and I got lucky, but also, and I was thinking of malaria pills for new doctors here, somehow I still got it, and then lost about 30 some pounds, and don't remember too much uh, about coming back, coming back to the Don, how many times have you been? Three, I harvested all these in three safaris, the big ones. Uh, here, there's two wildebeest that you've all seen in the big wildebeest uh, migration. These are pawas, and that's one of the, I have a great trail. She's ready for a wild game, this five acre escape, and includes the rhino. Those are now all identically closed and so on. And so we have a harvest of, I have a case buffalo. Chase 
new program that I never used before that shows how to make maps better. So basically, I redid my whole book and did a whole bunch of whole mess of new maps. And so because of that, I got delayed about two months. I really don't think I need to be. Well, this is be sure. I'm going to blow out your microphone here. Watch this. Got my girl start to on. You didn't even pass me up. Anyway, uh, I did bring the excerpts from this book. And this book, this new one that I said I would have out, is Francis Marion's Organ Book. No one's ever transcribed it and published it. Uh, there's parts and pieces, but no one's ever done the whole thing. And I don't know why. It's the most complete ordinary book of the entire Revolutionary War. It starts in 1775 and it goes all the way up to the end of the war. There is no other orderly book that does that, that goes through the entire war. And what's interesting about it, it covers Marion's conventional days. And then when he becomes a partisan, he's still got the orderly book going. And so because of that, you can see exactly what happens. And a lot of people's conception of what happens as a partisan warfare is you're running around being all grungy and dirty and nothing, you know, just hiding as much as you can. And you see by the organ book, no, it's not. He's doing the same thing he did when he was a conventional soldier. They're pulling guard. They're having court marshals. They're, they're doing everything soldiers do. Because you can't have a mob and win a war, no matter how much Hollywood and everything presents it that way. Now, what I have here is excerpts from the book. I'm going to just throw them in the middle of the table since all of you are spread out so much. And I made 50. I figured, uh, hopefully I don't have to be more than that, but if you want one, there they are. Now, I'm supposed to talk today about the Bridges campaign, and I'm going to start here so everybody gets a copy, because that way I'll miss the, the bullet. Also, my name is Patrick O'Kelly. Uh, we're Irish. <laughs> a lot of people leave the O off. single thing that happened in the two Carolinas I included in the books. I tried to use primary accounts. Now, because I do this so often, I, did, uh, I have this stuff memorized almost, but I do get the facts and dates wrong a lot. Sometimes people come up and ask me a question about something, and I can't give you an answer because i got to look it up in the book. But, Bridges Campaign. Sumter doesn't get a lot of credit in South Carolina because he tended to do a lot of things bad. If I had to relate Sumter to somebody in modern history. It's probably a lot like Pat, maybe a lot like Custer. He tended to make some unwise decisions, but in the end, the men would follow him, and they'd follow him all the way to death. And the Bridges campaigns didn't start with Marion, ironically. It started with Sumter. Now, here's how it went down. Cornwallis had left South Carolina. Cornwallis had left with his army going into North Carolina to pursue Greene right after yeah, the Battle of Calvin's. I'm not going to get into the whole campaign with Green, but basically most of the British Army that was in South Carolina had departed, and they brought in reinforcements, but most had left. From the time that Cornwallis left, I think all the British outposts and all the commanders just kind of hunkered down and waited to see what would happen, and they're hoping nothing would happen because they're literally out on their own. There are reinforcements, but there are so many little posts that it's very hard. Now, why are they in the little posts? All the supply lines leading to Cornwallis' army has to go up rivers. Not really roads, but mainly rivers. Now, you might hear of an ambush of a convoy on a road, but it's usually wagons going from one river to another river. But the rivers were like the interstates, and all these outposts guarded these rivers. And everybody's waiting to see what happens. Well, in comes Sumter. Sumter had been wounded badly in the Battle of Black Sox, November 8th. And you really don't hear from him again, but I don't think a bullet hole would slow him down that much. And he, when he recovered enough to actually do anything, he decided to strike while the army's out of the state. The first thing he tries to do is he tries to take Graham, which is up in Columbia, Fort Graham. And when he tries to take Fort Graham, he, uh, he doesn't do a very good job because he, he assaults the objective and lots of his men get wounded and killed. Well, Rada decides to send an army after him. He sends a guy called Doyle after him with 700 men and two artillery pieces. He has to get something. Now, Sumter's army usually numbers in the thousands, not the hundreds. 
Marion's army usually covers in dozens or hundreds. Never has the size that Sumter does. Now, at the same time, another army from Canada under the command of a guy called Maklaroff comes with two regiments and also uh, another artillery piece. Sumter learns of this, and he leaves Granby, and then he goes to a place called Belleville, lays siege to that. So he doesn't back off. He just goes and lays siege to another place away from the path of these armies. Now, when he lays siege to Belleville, he attacks it and gets some more of his men killed. And then he backs off, and he ambushes a convoy of wagons at a place right beside his house at Big Savannah. He knows the territory very well. It's literally in his own backyard. When he ambushes that convoy, he now has a bunch of goods. So he puts them on boats and sails them away. But the boats get intercepted and captured. So he wants to get them back. Now, what he does is he now attacks Fort Watson. Now, Watson, I think you've got a painting of it out here. Watson is a one that's built up on a large Indian mound. And Sumter thought it was lightly guarded. But what he didn't realize is when he attacked this fort, that the guy who it's named after, a guy named uh, Tadwell, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tadwell Watson, Watson, he brought 400 soldiers there. And Sumter didn't know it. So again, Sumter tended to attack without having the proper intelligence. But I think he believed that attack and move quick, and you'll uh, achieve your objective. Unfortunately, he got a lot of his men killed by doing that. Now, when he attacked Fort Watson, uh, he's got all these armies come after him. He finds out that Fort Watson's reinforced, so now he has to back off again. And Sumter departs the area around 6 March 1781. In fact, as he's departing the area, is they, they do one more attack where the British are trying to pursue him at a place called Radcliffe's Bridge. And Sumter then moves into an area around the high hills of the Santee, an area known as Skidmore <laughs> Swamp. Now, this army, you've got to figure, we've got three armies roaming around at that time. We've got the army under Watson, we got the army under Mackleroff, and we got the army under Doyle looking for Sumter. He has vanished. His whole army went home. And mainly his army went home, I think because they got tired of fighting for a month and getting themselves shot to pieces. So they disperse. And Sumter has dispersed. Now, during this time that Sumter is running around attacking these outposts and the British are pursuing him, he's asking for assistance from Marion. Now, Marion is in the east. And remember, I told you, Sumter has an army of thousands, and Marion has an army of dozens. Well, Marion tries to get his men to follow him out to assist Sumter, but Marion's men look at him like, we don't like Sumter, and we don't want to leave our homes. It's too far to go. So nobody follows him. So he's kind of like bouncing from plantation to plantation, trying to organize a force to assist Sumter, but his men won't go. Now, as the British are moving around trying to find Sumter, they start heading into Marion's area. Now it's different. Now we have people. The invaders are in our backyard. So now his men gather. Now, first thing that happened was Marion decided to intercept them as they entered into his area. The fringes of his area is where we're going to go today. First stop, uh, Wigwood Swamp. Now, what he did was he set up an ambush right there along the road in Wigwood Swamp. Now, you got to realize this is March, and the trees and the vegetation wouldn't have been that green. I mean, yeah, you have green year round here. But it wouldn't have been as thick as the summertime, so it would be easy to see through that swamp if you hit the right spot. Now, the guy who's coming through that swamp is Watson. And you've got to realize something about Watson. Number one, Watson is a guards officer. He's not this typical officer that doesn't know what he's doing. He's a guards officer. The guards officer tend to be a little bit better trained, have better equipment, have more experience. And Watson was very experienced. So who does he have leaving his column? Two South Carolinians. He's got one called Richburg and one called... Harrison, or I may be getting that wrong, but I may be talking about Richburg. Richburg used to be in the South Carolina regiments, the 6th South Carolina. And you see that a lot down south here where after Charleston, people thought, that's it, there's no way we can win anyway, and they start switching sides. So some of Marion's worst enemies were guys who actually he served with in the early days. Another good example of this is a guy called Ganey. Ganey and Marion served in the same regiment, the 2nd South Carolina regiment, and those two constantly fought all the way to the end of the war. Now, Richburg is leading the way. He knows the area. He's a South Carolinian. He knows exactly how Marion thinks. So he's observing the area. And they detect this ambush before it goes off at Weber Swamp. Now, the ambush, what ends the ambush? I'm not going to go into that tactics because it's an ambush. And an ambush is kind of like a bar fight with guns made. Uh, what they do is they fire into them. They fire back, back and forth, back and forth. And there's a lot of cavalry action where the cavalry tries to flank a camp because of the swamp. Marion's cavalry tries to, to flank the British and can't because they've got artillery. And in the end, the British fire their artillery, grape shot, and it clears out Marion's ranks and they depart. 
Now, Booba Swamp, Marion, in my opinion, is not the winner at all. Number one, he didn't destroy the British. Number two, he has to leave. Marion suffered 18 casualties at Booba Swamp, and the British only suffered, I think, three. So it's very one-sided. Now, those 18 casualties, I think Marion had uh, like three or four killed. The rest were wounded. But a wounded man still can't fight, so he's out of the action. Now, Marion backs off. Now, Watson moves to Candy's plantation. I think we're going there today. Now, he goes to Candy's plantation because now he has to figure out where is Marion. And he also has to figure out where's my other armies. They're all converging on this spot. So he's kind of like standing back. Now, and the, the thing with Wimbledon Swamp happened on 6 March. <coughs> Watson stays at Canty's until about 13 March. Now, that's about a week. And in a week's time, Marion recovers his forces. However, the British from those other armies are also moving in. Now, Mount Hood Swamp, Marion, uh, and Watson tries to cross the bridge there. And Marion tries to stop him. However, that is another one that is not a victory for Marion. Watson comes up, fires artillery, and Mary can, men can't react to artillery if they're not in a good position. So they have to back off. And so because of that, Watson does cross the Mount Hope Swamp. Now what happens next is another bridge. It's called the Lower Bridge of the Black River. And it doesn't have a specific name, it's just Lower Bridge of the Black River. Now what happens there is a second time Marion's men try to stop them. But now they've got a bridge where the terrain does work to their advantage. The two sides are running. You've got a high side, and you've got a low side. And Watson's on the high side. And so when he puts his artillery here, and he fires artillery at Marion's men, they can't wait really to press the barrels enough, so a lot of the, almost all the shots go over their head. So now Marion has an advantage. And so because of that, he sticks riflemen there, and he's got an excellent rifle group under the command of a guy called McCautry. Now McCautry's men start picking off these artillery men, because you've got to get close to that bridge to fire the artillery because of the vegetation. And then, as they try to cross the river, McCautry's men pick them off. So now Marion has the advantage. Now, McCart uh, Watson can't cross that bridge. He backs up, and he goes to Witherspoon's plantation. Now, he stays there for a short period of time. Now, at the lower bridge, Marion's men did suffer casualties. He, they suffered 12 casualties, and Watson's men suffered 13. So you can call the lower bridge a draw. So up till now, neither side's really winning. It's, uh, it's two losses for Marion and a draw for the British and Marion. Now, at Witherspoon's plantation, what happens is they continually snipe at him. Marion's men sniping at him, firing at him. At one point, Watson uh, sends out a, a, a courier saying, what you're doing is against the rules of warfare. You don't snipe at sentries. I think they're just stalling for time. They know the game. It's, it's what I call big boy rules. Big boy rules. You know what's going to happen. People die. It's war. But they're just stalling for time, both of them trying to hope that either Marion's hoping that he can conquer the British, or the British are hoping that that army gets to him so that they can crush Marion. I don't think he was really worried about Marion or fear him because he's holding his own, but he wants a bigger force to hit Marion from the rear while he hits from the front. Now, every time Watson sends out a courier or somebody to tell, uh, to link up with that one military force that's out there, the force under Doyle, those couriers get killed. So Doyle really doesn't know what's going on with this one's fair. Now this goes on for about close to two weeks. What happens then, uh, Watson, why not, I, let me take a rephrase, it doesn't go off for two weeks. Watson tries to cross the bridge again. When he doesn't, he moves to a new plantation that's got better ground for him, a little bit farther field of fire where Mary couldn't get as close. And this new plantation is Blakely. And it's, all these plant plantations are near King Street. Now Blakely's plantation, he stays there until the 27th, stalling for time. However, I think he realizes nobody's going to reinforce it, so he decides to get out. Also, he is suffering casualties every day. It's a war of attrition. Marion's men are surrounding the British, and he can use from the countryside all of the men that uh, there. However, Watson, every time one of his men get killed or wounded, they're out. So he's slowly being depleted. Well, by the 28th, he's lost quite a few men. He has to get out. So what he decides to do is, when I was in the Army, I was in the work, we, we called something called a breakout in a circle. And what it is is you put just massive firepower in one spot. And everybody just kind of run through it. I hope the guy didn't die on the way. And that's basically what the British did. They just decided to go as push, push for Georgetown. Now, Watson originally came from Fort Watson. He can't go back that way, but he's going for Georgetown now because that's the nearest safe haven. Now, when he pushes, they're going down the road. The Marion's men have blocked the road with trees, with, uh, they burned bridges, and they've done a lot of stuff in two weeks making sure that the British couldn't get to Georgetown, and vice versa, reinforcements couldn't get to Watson. But as they go across kind of the roads, the British, Watson, is not a stupid commander. He's an excellent commander. He goes cross-country. 
And so he starts moving through these swamps at a high rate of speed. And they keep moving until they get to Sandpit Bridge. Now, Sandpit Bridge is about five miles outside of Georgetown. There is a bridge still there. Uh, but when they get to this bridge, Marion has a blocking force there. And he's got a company of men. But as the British come up, they're coming up what's called close column. In other words, it's one densely packed rectangle. It kind of looks like an old Roman phalanx or something. And they're coming on with bayonets. And they're not stopping. They don't use the bridge. You just hit the water and go. And so the Marion's men that are in the way, they don't see these guys stopping or slowing down or, or, or panicking. So because of that, they break away and they rush. They just get out of the path of this, this, this phalanx coming at them. Now, Watson finally gets to Georgetown with Marion pursuing him. But once he gets to Georgetown, Georgetown is a rather well-fortified place. So Marion cannot pursue from there. Watson actually moves out of town a little bit north to a plantation called Trapier's Plantation, kind of like near where Plantersville is now. Now, what Watson lost on that last push was a lot. Marion lost one guy. Watson lost 58. So it was a, it was a, a, it was a, a gamble. The gamble was, can I get through these guys without being captured? Kind of like what I told you to break out of the circle. The gamble worked. He got his army through, but he lost 58 guys when he did. But you've got to look at it as a commander. Your army didn't get captured. Your men aren't prisoners. But you lost a lot of men. You can always come back and fight. So I think it was a good move on Watson's account. I think Watson actually, you know, I don't look at him as a stupid British guy. He did rather well in, those, in that time period. But he's going up against Marion, who has the advantage of the terrain. And Marion has the advantage of a continuous supply of manpower. Because as they are hurting the British, all the guys who are sitting on the fence at home, all of a sudden they're like, oh, I'm a lot braver now. We're winning. And so he gets more people showing up to assist him. Now, something else happened at that time. The rest of the Bridges campaign is, as Marion is fighting Watson, remember the other army, the army of Doyle? Doyle's coming down the PD. And they're trying to find Marion, too. But then they start hearing of Marion's secret hideout, which really wasn't a secret. Snow's Island, which really isn't an island. Well, it is, but not where he was staying. So he tries to find this place. Turns out he's able to find this place because a lot, there's a whole back room intrigue going on during the Bridges campaign. And what's happening is they are capturing Marion's officers and they're threatening to kill them. Now, Marion actually wrote that they executed three of his officers, but I don't know who he's talking about. I never have been able to figure that out. So I don't know if that was rumor or fact, but he says, you're killing my officers. And so Marion tells Rawdon down there in Charleston that if I capture your men, I'm going to kill them. Well, he does capture one of his men. He captures a guy, uh, a cornet called Marion, who was with the Queen's Rangers. And Marion gets imprisoned at Snow's Island. However, Marion is also a pretty squared away officer. He's able to basically lead an escape out of Snow's Island. And as he escapes, he gets back to Georgetown, but he also hears about the army of Doyle approaching. So he's ordered to go up to Doyle and tell where Snow's Island is, because he knows where it is now. So Doyle knows where Snow's Island is. And Doyle's able to hit Snow's Island from two sides. Now, Marion left the guy in charge there. He realizes, I'm compromised. It's a secret base. It's not that secret anymore. So he burns what he can, has a slight delaying action, and he departs. But Marion's base is now gone. In the big picture, it doesn't matter. It's South Carolina. You want another base? Just walk that one. You'll find one. Um, but the British had succeeded in destroying Marion's supply base. But Marion had succeeded in, in hurting badly the British. And then Sumter, on top of that, had succeeded in making the British very worried about the fact that Cornwallis is gone and these partisans have not backed off. Now, what happens next is at the end of the Guilford Courthouse campaign, uh, Green sends Lee south to join with Marion and start taking out these forts that Sumter had already tried to take out. And then what happens next is a whole new campaign where Lee and Marion start collapsing the forts which leads up with Green coming into South Carolina, which then leads to Green conquering, well, not really conquering, getting beaten battles, but the fact that he, he's decimating the British. It's a war of attrition, which eventually leads to the British collapsing and going into Charleston. So this campaign led to the slow decimation of these forts. However, from the time this campaign started until the time the British collapse and go into Charleston is only about six months. Now, I've been talking for about 30 minutes. They told me 45. I'm going to open up the rest of it for any questions, because uh, if you have any at all, I'll be here. Other than that, that's all I have for the Bridges campaign.
Any questions? Who make up the troops following Royal 